The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day and welcome to the InnoSight webinar on new mindsets for strategists in uncertain times. Please hold tight for just a minute or two as other audience members gather and get a chance to tune in. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome everyone to the InnoSight webinar. We'll be just getting started in a minute. Please hold tight as other audience members get a chance to tune in. Welcome everyone to the InnoSight webinar on new mindsets for strategists in uncertain times. This is Evan Schwartz, I'm Director of Storytelling at InnoSight and your moderator today. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Scott Anthony, who is here with us in our Boston headquarters. Scott is InnoSight's managing partner. He's based in our Asia Pacific offices in Singapore. He's the author of several books from Harvard Business Review Press. He'll draw today on some of the lessons from his new executive briefing, How to Turn Ambiguity into Opportunity, a New Approach to Strategy Under Uncertainty, which is available at InnoSight.com. We want to hear from you, so we'll be taking breaks to pose interactive polls and to answer your questions. So just type your question in the dialog box located in the control panel in the upper right corner of the screen. No need to click um, the raise your hand button. Feel free to put in your personal perspective or company perspective into your question. I'll be collecting them and posing them to Scott. And so now I turn it over to Scott Anthony. 
Thank you very much, Evan. And depending on what part of the world you all are from, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. The clock is just hit 12.01 here in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, those of you who know me know that I usually find myself in Singapore, where our Asia-Pacific operations are headquartered, but I, I'm very pleased to be in the east coast of the United States on an absolutely beautiful day today. So I wanted to share some thoughts today about this topic of strategy through uncertainty. I wanted to first start by letting you know a little bit about where some of these observations have come from. As you know, Innosight is a growth strategy company that focuses on growth transformation. We were founded by legendary Harvard business professor Clayton Christensen. We took Christensen's ideas, ideas of other like-minded academics, and over the 16 years of our existence have worked with executives all around the globe to confront some of the existential challenges of growing in today's very uncertain times. We help people set strategic direction, build capabilities to follow through on those directions, and go and drive the growth initiatives that allow them to turn into the next version of themselves. And as we've gone through this journey with executives, as we've read the literature around strategy, as we've been on the front line of strategy, we've collected some observations about what it takes to successfully drive strategy in today's times of increasing uncertainty. Let me tell you a little bit about my first experience with the kinds of challenges that executives all around the world are confronting today. Let's go back in time. I'm going to take you back to the year 1994. Here I am in the year 1994. At the time, I was the managing editor of a daily newspaper. You can probably tell quickly from looking at the picture here, this is not the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or any other major newspaper. No, I was the managing editor of my college newspaper. 1994 was a critical year in the media industry. It was the beginning of a widespread transformation whose effects are still being felt today. What happened in 1994? Well, many of you might recognize this picture here. This, of course, is O.J. Simpson in the white Ford Bronco being chased by the L.A. Police Department. I kid a little bit by showing this picture, but in all seriousness, this was a big deal because this was one of the first times that the major news networks went from doing what they were supposed to do, cover news, to provide minute-by-minute -minute coverage of something that honestly didn't matter all that much. And of course, we turn on the television, we log into our computers today, and this is what we see. We see people screaming at us, we see minutia covered in excruciating detail. But the real thing that happened in 1994 that ended up transforming the industry was this. In the end of 1994, Mark Andreessen and his team introduced the Netscape browser. For the first time, the layperson could access the commercial internet. Of course, the internet had existed for decades, primarily used by academics and military departments, but now anyone could access it. And this started a chain of events that would lead to massive change in the industry. As I mentioned, I was on the front line of that change. I was the managing editor of, of the paper at my school, Dartmouth College. Creatively enough, the paper was called The Dartmouth. Now, those of you who know anything about Dartmouth know that it's located in a very bucolic town called Hanover, New Hampshire. The town's small. There's about 10,000 people in it. Not much happens in Hanover. We would have headlines like, Town Considering Adding a Second Stoplight, which they did during my sophomore year. It was a really big deal. Or, Moose on the Loose in the cafeteria, which actually would happen on occasion. Somehow, despite there not being much going on in Hanover, we put out this newspaper five days a week. Pretty small, 8, 12, 16-page mini-tab, but we were serious about it. We had a staff of about 50 people, mostly volunteers, and we worked hard to put out the best newspaper we could. So there we were, the executive team of an organization confronting an existential change, a disruptive technology coming to our market. We had to, like you have to, decide what to do. So what did we do? The first thing we did was nothing. When we saw the internet come, our first feeling wasn't excitement, it wasn't optimism, it wasn't hope, it was terror. You see, we had a nice little business model at the newspaper. 
we mostly made money by charging people to subscribe to the paper. We had about $250,000 a year in revenue. About two-thirds of it was from subscriptions. Even today, people have not figured out how to charge for content online. So the terror we had was pretty appropriate. We got over that terror. After all, we had no shareholders, no board of directors. We were college kids. It's the time in our lives when we could take wild and crazy risks. But we didn't take wild and crazy risks. We didn't reimagine. We didn't reinvent. We didn't reconfigure the business. Instead, once a week, we would go and pick the stories that we liked the most from the print version of the newspaper and create exact replicas of them online. Our intent wasn't to drive in a new direction. If you look closely at the picture at the bottom of your screen, you'll see this big green button that said subscribe to the D. We tried to force fit new technology through the lens of our historical business model. I would later learn when I studied with Clay Christensen at the Harvard Business School that this is what companies usually do when they encounter very disruptive change. They fail to allocate sufficient resources to it. They fail to reimagine the business in the face of it. How does it all end? Well, if you live in the United States and you've watched what happened to the U.S. newspaper industry, you know that it has not ended well. This is one of the most stunning charts you will see about the impact of disruptive change. If you look at this chart and you study it, there's a couple interesting things you see. First, this doesn't happen overnight. My story begins in 1994, which is right around this point in the curve. The next 12 years were actually pretty good for the newspaper industry. Ups and downs, but the industry grew from 94 to 2006. It was really after that 12 years of growth that you see the second stunning thing. 55 years of growth eviscerated in five short years. This is an incredibly difficult challenge. And it is a challenge that more and more people are facing all around the globe. If you're a fan of Insight, you know a piece of research that we regularly refresh is research originally done by Richard Foster, a professor at Yale who served on our board of advisors for a number of years, looking at the turnover in the S&P 500 index. If you look at how this has evolved over time and you forecast in the future, you see a number that is following a very clear trend line down, where companies used to be on the S&P 500 for 30, 40 years on average. Now it's heading down to the low teens, which means that 50% of the companies that are on today's S&P 500 index are not going to be there in a decade. What's happened over the last few years? Well, there have been some great companies that have left the index. Some of these companies, like Eastman Kodak, went through bankruptcy. Some of these companies just became a little bit smaller. U.S. Steel, which was one of the core companies in the original index, still exists, but it's been overtaken by faster companies. Some of these companies have been acquired and joined with other companies. You, of course, then have new companies coming into the index. Some of these are companies that existed for a while, people like Accenture, that get to a certain size. Others, like Facebook and Netflix, are companies that didn't exist 20 years ago. In Facebook's case, it's only a 12-year-old company, now one of the 15 most valuable companies in the world. This used to be something that only affected technology industries, but as in the words of Mark Andreessen, software eats the world, this is affecting every nook and cranny of the global economy. If you watch Game of Thrones or have read the book on which it is based, you know the Stark family has a saying, winter is coming. It is not winter that is coming to your business. It is disruption. Every business, every business model today faces a clear and present danger as a range of different technologies, a range of different business models have the chance to rip apart your business. As you start to deal with the challenges that this faces, you have a fundamental challenge that the historical way that we approach strategy doesn't work in a world that's changing as quickly as the world is changing today. When new companies come out of seemingly nowhere, go from nothing to great big giants in the blink of an eye, industry lines blur, etc. These are some of the biggest challenges you face. The data that you need to make decisions only exists about the past. 
if you're trying to make a future-facing decision, you cannot only use historical data. You can't look just in your market because many of the biggest disruptions will come from a different part of the global economy. You can't know what the right business model is in the beginning. You have to experiment to discover it. And the competitors you have to worry about aren't the ones that you're competing against today. Well, you have to worry about those, but you also have to worry about a completely different set of competitors. The tools and approaches that we use in a more static or slowly moving environment are simply inappropriate for a world that changes at this pace. So we mentioned that we would like to hear from you. Here is the, the first chance to get your voice into the discussion. We would love to hear from you about the challenges that you face. We've got a simple poll question here, the hardest part about strategy in today's disruptive times. So we're going to launch the poll here. You've got four choices. What do you see as the biggest challenge for driving strategy or setting strategy in today's disruptive time? Is it spotting the trends that could affect you? understanding the impact of those trends, setting a direction, or executing against it. We'll keep the poll open for maybe about 45 seconds and see what you have to say. I see the votes coming in. We've got a neck and neck race at the moment, so keep your votes coming in. All right, Kristen, let's give them 10 more seconds and open it up. All right, you can see the results on your screen here. So 11% of you said spotting key trends, 9% said understanding the impact, and then the remaining 70 or the remaining 79%, yeah, did, did my math there, the remaining 79% said setting a direction, executing against it. We agree with this. You know, I think it is important to be rigorous in spotting the trends and understanding the impact of the trends. But that's usually not the hardest challenge that people face. I'm glad that you answered the way that you did because the next set of materials that I'll talk about talk first about setting a strategic direction. We'll talk about that for a few minutes, take some questions from the audience. Then we'll talk a little bit about executing against that direction, which in our eyes is the biggest challenge that you face through uncertainty. And again, have a chance to pause and get some questions from you. So how do you set a strategic direction in the case of uncertainty? You've done the work, you've spotted the trends, you've got a good view of the impact of those trends. What do you do next? Well, we've got a metaphor that we use to help inform the way that we think about this. The key important thing that we think you need to do is essentially to change your orientation. Now, a lot of times when we're setting strategic directions, we go and do a lot of analysis. We go and develop or get as much industry research as we possibly can. We go and look at the trends. We go and analyze the trends. We go and try and take a fact and data-based approach to setting strategy. That is equivalent to getting in your car, looking in the rear view mirror, and beginning to drive forward. It does not work. Well, it works, but it doesn't end particularly well. You cannot move forward only looking backwards. Because if you do that, you consign yourself to doing things that historically made sense that might not make sense in the future. What we suggest people do is to take what we call a future back mindset and follow a future back approach. What this means is you take a look at the trends that are taking place today, you do your best to understand what that will mean the future will look like, and then you start by putting yourself in that future state. Maybe it's five years in the future, maybe it's 20 or 30 years in the future, and you write your future story. What will the future version of your organization look like? The word story here is important. I've got three kids who are 10, 8, and 4 years old. Anyone who has kids will appreciate this. You ask a child, what are you going to be when you grow up? They give you a story. My son Charlie wants to be a baseball player. My eight-year-old Holly, she loves animals, she wants to be a vet. My four-year-old, he's a bit of a goofball. He said he comes from Mars and he wants to go back there. Maybe Elon Musk will let him do that, I don't know. But there's a story behind what they want to do. What they don't do is say that they're going to be six foot one inch tall, that they're going to live in a house that's 2,381 square feet, and their checking account will have these numbers as the last three decimal points in it. But that's what we do often when we create our future strategy. 
it's all about numbers. Of course, you need numbers, you need objectives, but you need a narrative as well that describes who you're going to be. That's the first plan of a future back strategy, the story of the future version of yourself. Then we call it future back because after you have set that future vision, that future story, you then follow a set of steps to walk backwards to determine, and this is an intentionally awkward verb tense, what will have to have happened in order for you to go from where you are today to create that future version of yourself. It means identifying, and I'll talk about this more in just a second, what are the strategic moonshots that you will launch to set you in that direction? What are then the specific things that will be in your growth portfolio? How will that all build up to what you will be in the future? And then critically, what will you start doing tomorrow to begin to advance in that direction? This isn't just scenario planning. This isn't just dreaming about the future. It's having that clear future story, who we're going to become, and then a very clear tactical plan for how you're going to get there. That is the first key to strategic direction through uncertainty. It's taking a future back mindset, making sure you've got that future story of your organization, and then having the components that allow you to actually go and write that story. Let's talk a little bit about the strategic moonshots here. Now, I started by talking about the challenges in today's world and used the word disruption several times. Often when people hear that word, they immediately begin to think about the threats. And I started with a scare story. I told you about how my newspaper struggled, about how the U.S. newspaper industry was ripped apart. And disruption can indeed be a scary concept. Even when we say it, our mouths contort in ways that make us feel like it's a bad thing. But remember, disruption is a massive growth opportunity. Let's go back to the newspaper industry. The companies that appear on the page here are companies that did not exist at the beginning of the story. You can see here the market capitalization of these companies as of Monday of this week. This is close to one trillion U.S. dollars of value that has been created. The newspaper industry has been a growth industry. Unfortunately, in this case, it wasn't market leaders or incumbents who caught most of that growth. Instead, it was new startup companies who came up with new content, new advertising, and new delivery models that captured this growth. But that need not necessarily be the case. If you look back 20 or 30 years ago, our research suggests that almost all disruptive innovations were launched by new entrants. But if you look over the course of the last 20 years, we see a meaningful number of disruptions that are launched by market incumbents. One of the examples I profiled in the article is one that I am thankful for almost every day that I'm in Singapore. This is in the bottom left of the screen. I am a passionate baseball fan. I have been since the day I was born. Singapore is 12 hours away from the east coast of the United States, which means the baseball games that are in the night here are in the morning in Singapore. I'm very thankful then that about 20 years ago, Major League Baseball created a separate unit, Major League Baseball Advanced Media, and created a strategy to take advantage of the internet to bring baseball and its content to new people in new places in new ways. Now, of course, the internet in those days wasn't what it is today. Bandwidth wasn't, it wasn't what it is today. So it didn't start with the great key quality streaming video that I get today. No, you could get audio broadcasts that were a little bit scratchy, that allowed you to enjoy your home team or your home team out of town. But the technology gets better and better to the point where today you can watch crystal clear imaging on any device in any part of the world. And this has turned into a big business for Major League Baseball. Disney just made a big investment in the business just a couple weeks ago. And is one of just a small number of examples of large companies taking disruptive innovation and turning it into a big opportunity. So that's another key thing that you have to keep in mind as you set a strategic direction. You have your future back strategy. You recognize that the disruptive trends that are the threats to your business are also the greatest growth opportunities. You then have to do the work to translate that into specific areas, specific strategic moonshots. 
we are not big believers in letting thousands of flowers. This isn't about trying hundreds or thousands of things because every time we've seen organizations try to do that, try to approach growth in a completely unfocused way, all you see are a lot of dead and trampled flowers. What instead we suggest people do is to create those iconic moonshots, intentionally borrowing language used by John F. Kennedy when he announced a plan in the early 1960s to send a man to the moon and very importantly, bring him back by the end of the decade. Not only is a moonshot something that captures the imagination, Kennedy's idea was actually very good strategy. If you remember, this is before my time, but for reading the history books, the U.S. was behind the Russians in the space race in the early 1960s by quite a distance. But it turned out the technologies that you need to develop to go to the moon, the long lift that you need to get rockets that will go that distance, was something that the U.S. had comparative advantage in developing given its defense infrastructure, given its university infrastructure. Kennedy very carefully studied before he proclaimed his strategy. His Vice President Lyndon Johnson looked at the underlying technology and said, this is something that we can actually do. So you too, as a good strategist, will want to identify a small number of strategic moonshots that you can launch. We call these in more prosaic terms, strategic opportunity areas. They're called strategic because they fit your future back strategy. They're opportunity because these are the places where you're going to drive new and different growth. And they're areas because you haven't come up with your very specific tactical plan. Instead, you found a problem worth solving. You found something that's sufficient. Enough people are struggling to solve it that can be material for you. That you have an idea about how you can solve that uniquely fits your strategy. That you have something that would give you an unfair advantage if you were to go into that market. Just like Major League Baseball did, because it controlled or had the ability to control the rights of broadcasting, it was able to do something that no startup in the world could do. You want to think similarly, what are the problems worth solving that we are uniquely positioned to take the underlying disruptive trends that are threats to our business and turn them into exciting strategic growth opportunities? So those are the thoughts about how you set the strategic direction in the face of uncertainty. Just to summarize what I talked about here, the first idea was creating a future back strategy grounded in a story of who you're going to become, what the next version of yourself will look like, combined with a plan for how you're going to get there. Recognizing that a key lever to pull is disruption, because while it feels like a threat, it actually is a mammoth growth opportunity, and a key plank of your plan is to identify those few strategic moonshots that will allow you to drive in new and different directions. So I'd like to pause here, Evan, and, and see if there's any good questions or even mediocre questions or perhaps even great questions that have come in from our audience today. So I, I see in the right side of my eye there are questions that have been streaming in. Thanks to those of you who have done it. Please give us more questions. The more the merrier. And Evan fires them at me. Sure. Um, Thomas says, has a good one. He points out that not all responses to disruption are about problem solving using newspaper case. Few of any of the brands on your list, like Google Ad AdWords, were products or services that consumers were explicitly asking for or expressed the need for. So how do you explain how to respond to that disruption? And so it, it's a great question. And I'll make it a few points. I think first just an observation about Google. Uh, you heard their AdWords and, and it's an important thing to note. A lot of people think of Google as a technology or search company and they might say, well, why did I include it as a media example? But if you understand how Google actually makes money, you know that it is an advertising company. AdWords, AdSense are, are the key drivers of its business model and its profit model. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to note. I think it's also important to note that Google did not know this when it launched the company. Google was not the keen search engine, it was the 18th. It took a few years before, through a series of experiments, it came up with this idea and then prospered and grew. So then the question, how do you identify if customers aren't going to tell you that Henry Ford, probably apocryphal line, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. 
how do you identify those areas? Well, the Intersight belief, and this is described in great detail in my colleague's book, along with Clay Christensen coming out in October, Competing Against Luck, Intersight's belief is to really focus on this idea of the job to be done. What is the progress that a customer is trying to make in a particular circumstance that is a struggle for them? And advertising, as a general field, is an area where there's lots of struggles. People don't actually want to advertise. They're not doing that because they like to advertise. They're doing it because they want to build their business. And Google's insight that leads to AdWords and AdSense is the combination of search words with advertisements tied to those search words is a very powerful way for companies to get new customers, to get new transactions, to get new sales. So the idea of really trying to zero in on the job, find the problem that is not well solved, find areas where consumption is constrained, that's the single best piece of advice from us about how you spot new opportunities for growth. And of course then to make that happen, you've got a couple, a problem not well solved with a good solution, with a viable business model. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So that, that's my answer to that question, Evan. I hope that passed muster. Yes, uh, and keep um, posing your questions. We're, we're getting a few really good ones here, and, there, and we'd love more. We have one from VJ who says, what percentage of revenue should a company set aside and spend in moonshots? What, is there any objective measure to determine if you're doing enough in that space? I, it, it's a great question. The answer is there is no one-size-fits-all answer that you should spend this amount of revenues or your research and development budget or whatever it is. It's another reason why coming up with a good future back strategy is critical. Because if you do this right, if you write your future story and say this is what we need to look like, and you really understand your present, what well, you will all we see is a very clear gap between the future and the present. In some contexts, we have seen a massive gap when an industry is going through a big disruption, the core is going to disappear, where you really need to invest a lot in going and doing different things. In other cases, you've got a core engine that is profitable, healthy, will remain that way, so you might allocate less of your resources to the new and different. The way Google thinks about it, it says, not seven, I'm sorry, it says 70% of its efforts is taking its core engine and making it better. 20% is pushing into adjacent areas, and 10% of its investment is focused on the really new and different strategic moonshots that Google X and Associated Labs are working on. That's not a one-size-fits-all answer, but I think the 70-20-10 split is a reasonable, at least, starting point for people to think about. But it has to be grounded in who you are, what is the reality of your environment, and what do you hope to be Great. We have a very quick one here. When writing your future story, in what tense should it be? Uh, Evan, you, you, you are our storytelling <laughs> maven, so I, I, I imagine you've got a perspective on this. But it should be written in the present tense, so this is fun. So you're writing a future story, but you're writing it in present tense, because you're describing this is. This is the world that we will live in in those days. And then you're using the, I don't even know what verb tense it is, the what will have to have happened. My seventh grade grammar teacher can probably explain what tense that is. I don't know. Probably the future flu perfect. Future flu perfect. You, you heard it here, folks. The future flu perfect tense is, is the tr transitional one. So it is present tense to describe the future, and the future flu perfect tense to describe the past. How about uh, one more question now, and then we'll turn to the next set of materials. Yeah, we have a question about Sometimes a company can develop a beautiful long-term strategy on paper, but when it comes to executing it, it sometimes falls apart. What's going on here, and what, what can you do about it? Well, this is a, this is a great transitional question. So what I'm going to do to answer that, I, I remember once I was giving a, a presentation or watching a presentation, and the person who was presenting said there are three types of questions you get from audiences. A really good question is one where you actually have to think about what the answer is. A great question is one where you've got the answer already. An outstanding question is one where you've got a PowerPoint slide prepared to answer it. That is an outstanding question because that is the next thing that we will talk about. I think one of the general mistakes that people make is they think the hard part of strategy, the hard part about innovation more broadly, 
is coming up with an idea. This is a picture of my 10-year-old boy, Charlie. He was trying on the idea hat in a recent vacation that we took. I have an idea. And you can see what's on top of his head, the international symbol for innovation, the light bulb. Now, if you ask who invented the light bulb to any group of people, they will immediately respond with Thomas Edison. It's not really right. He didn't truly invent the light bulb. Lots of other people got to the technology first. But he most certainly innovated the provision of light. Edison was a con consummate innovator, great inventor to 2,000 patents to his name. But Edison was obsessed with turning ideas into paper, the creation of value. The world's first electrical generating facility was in Lower Manhattan, owned by the Edison Electric Company. That company merged with one of its rivals, created General Electric, a company that obviously lives on until today. Never forget Edison's most famous quote, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're not sweating, if you're not working hard to take that idea on paper and actually make it real, you are not successfully innovating, you are not driving in new strategic directions. The field of research or the academic lineage that led to Clay Christensen and some of the affiliated thought leaders is known as the resource-based view of the firm. And one of the lines from Joe Bauer, one of the great intellectual forefathers of that line of thinking, is on the top of the page here. Strategy is never more than 49% of the answer. In all too many cases, you see people who spot it, who identify it, who plan for it, but still struggle. I could go through many examples on the page here of people who identified disruptive changes happening relatively early, who took action relatively early, and still didn't get it right. One of the great examples of this that I will highlight here is in the upper left. The title of that story, Microsoft Bid to Beat Google Builds on a History of Misses, explains it all. The story in painstaking detail describes how this combination that we talked about before, varying search terms to advertising keywords, Microsoft identified this. Microsoft made some early investments in this. Microsoft began to try it. However, it asked its MSN content division that made a lot of money through content advertising, display ads, and so on, to go and run the experiment. And the article by Rob Guth in the Wall Street Journal describes how they very quietly poisoned the experiment. Even though they saw it, even though they had the pieces, they screwed it up and Google today is where Google is. So you have example after example of companies that are almost there, that are so close that don't quite manage to pull it off. So I'm curious to hear from this group about what they think is the hardest problem here. So we've got five choices, our second and final poll of today's webinar, about what makes it difficult to go from good strategy on paper to successful execution. Kristen, if you can launch that poll now. So is it our decision-making tools can't handle the uncertainty that comes with doing something new? There's inertia or risk aversion in our organization. All of our systems and structures privilege doing today better over tomorrow new or different. Is our leadership too short-term focused? Do we have pressures from external environments, stakeholders and shareholders? What is the big driver that makes this hard? We've got votes streaming in. 31% of people have voted today. Very close race. Hey, Kristen, why don't we close the poll? I think we've got stability, close to stability here, and show it to the group. All right, so you can see here the edges. Only 4% of you said your decision-making tools are the issue. Only 7% said pressure from stakeholders and shareholders, which is interesting. I would have expected that to be a little higher. The three answers that were most common were the ones in the middle. Organizational inertia, systems that favor today better over tomorrow new, and leadership in too short-term focus. Kristen, let's go back to the, the slide deck and let's talk about a couple of our perspectives here. So how do you deal with the reality that you have organizations that, that are perhaps of their nature a little averse to taking risk? How do you deal with the fact that systems do privilege doing today better over tomorrow different? So those are a couple things we'll talk about over the course of the next 15 minutes or so before opening up 
again for questions and then providing a few summary thoughts and calling it a webinar. So I've been in this field now for, I think you can call it reasonably, 16 years. And in that time, I've seen hundreds if not thousands of ideas to go and launch ex exciting new ideas to strategically move a company in a new and different direction. Some of these are from global giants. Some of these are from startup companies. Some of these are from employees inside Insight, the 100 folks that we have across our offices in Massachusetts, Singapore, and Switzerland. All of these ideas are the same because every idea to innovate and move in a new strategic direction is partially right and partially wrong. The trick when you're standing at what I call the first mile of innovation is you don't know which part is which. Now the default behavior inside most organizations is to try to solve this problem through analysis. We will remove risk by analyzing a problem to depth. We will run focus groups, we'll do customer interviews, we'll do market research, we'll talk to experts, we'll hold, hold alignment meetings, we'll hold alignment meetings to plan the alignment meetings, we'll hold alignment meetings to pick the food for the alignment meetings for the alignment meetings. Finally, out of all of this, we will come up with the perfect plan. We go and launch, only to learn a life lesson taught by the great American philosopher, actor, and occasional boxer, Mike Tyson, who once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. The punch the would-be innovator receives is the plan that looks so good on paper ended up resting on shaky assumptions. What you want to do as a good strategist is change the way that you approach uncertainty. Approach the uncertainty in a very systematic, strategic way. In the first mile, I laid out a very simple acronym called DEFT to help you remember how to do this. The D stands for document. You want to make sure you take the time to spell out your strategy in a degree of depth. Now, don't write a PhD language because there's that much of it but make sure you've been comprehensive about what it is you plan to do. You then pick it up and evaluate it from multiple perspectives. Not to figure out if it's good or bad, you really can't know in the early stages, but to try to separate out the few things that you can be confident in around from the very many things you're assuming. That then serves as input to the third part of the process, where you focus on the areas of greatest uncertainty. We've got a very simple table that we use to help to figure out where to focus. This looks at the three factors that need to be true for your idea to succeed. It has to target a real market need, it has to deliver against that need, and the numbers have to work. This table very quickly shows you how confident you should be about each of those areas. Is there a need? A customer says there's a need actually means very little. The thing that we've learned from our time in Innovation's First Mile is that people lie. They lie all the time, not because they're trying to mislead you, but because we don't do an accurate job of reporting what we're going to do in the face of future uncertainty. So you listen to what people say, but you watch more closely what they show with their own behavior. You feel more confident when they've used your idea, much more confident when they pay for it. You're almost there when they've done it more than once. And when they're telling their friends about it, that's when you can be really clear that you fit a need. Can you deliver against it? Everything starts with a dream. Dreams are great. Don't invest billions behind a dream. Find ways to make it progressively more tangible to increase your confidence. Do the numbers work? Well, building a spreadsheet, building a financial model is helpful. But that only gets you up to yellow on our chart. Remember. A spreadsheet is nothing more than mathematical relationships between largely made up assumptions. As Scott Cook, the chairman of Intuit, likes to say, for every one of our failures, we had spreadsheets that looked awesome. You need to find a way to take the numbers on paper or in electron form and make it real because it is only when you can see a path to profitability that you can begin to get confident and it's only when you deliver that you really can be sure. The final letter in the acronym, and probably the most important one, is T for test, where you want to test rapidly and learn quickly. How do you go and do this? The way I'd like to explain this is by using a metaphor. You go back about 110 years ago, people were obsessed. The industrial era was upon us. We've been through the scientific revolution. The machine age is here. 
birds were flying and humans weren't. And this really bugged people. So what did people do? Well, people came up with all sorts of crazy ideas to try to solve the problem. They created what you would call in the language of the lean startup, minimum viable products that took their ideas and brought them into reality. These things didn't work. They crashed, which meant that if people weren't badly harmed in the crash, they had to start over. It was expensive and time consuming. A couple of bicycle merchants from Ohio, the Wright brothers, cracked the problem. And the way that they did it is really instructive. Before they built a plane, they flew a kite. The great thing about a kite is when it crashes, and it always does, nobody gets hurt. It's easy to go try again. To optimize their kite, they built a wind tunnel. Imagine how it felt in 1901. Everybody else is working on these crazy contraptions, and you hack together bicycle spoke wire, a cardboard box, and a fan. And in two months, you run 200 experiments testing almost types of wind design. This broke the back of the problem. This is what good strategists need to do. If you're deft, you figure out ways to create wind tunnels, to fly kites, to go and figure out cheap, affordable, effective ways to learn. Prototyping is one way you do this, but there's a lot of other ways that you can and help your organization can get really good at designing and executing experiments. One more word here before I talk about another challenge that you really see that gets in the way of successful innovation and successful strategy changes. As we start to think about what we just talked about, about flying kites and building wind tunnels, and how you approach strategy through uncertainty, it requires that you reframe what risk means. Sometimes the riskiest thing that you can do is nothing. A number of you said that risk aversion is a challenge in your organization. If you do the analysis right and you understand the trends correctly, in many cases, standing still for an organization is a recipe for disaster. A lot of times people say, well, the reason why we have risk aversion is because we don't reward people the way that entrepreneurs get rewarded. That might be true, but in our experience, it isn't a lack of reward for results that holds you back. In most cases, it's the presence of punishment if something doesn't quite work. Innovation is never a straight line. There will be false steps, there will be fumbles, and if you punish people for those false steps and fumbles, no surprise, they're not going to take any risk. A mistake people make about entrepreneurs is they think entrepreneurs are risk seekers. They're not. What a great entrepreneur is, is a great risk mitigator. They're great at managing risk. They know the probable outcome of what they're doing is failure. So they try to find as many ways as possible to share and spread risk. Finally, inside many organizations, people will tell you, we're encouraging failure. Why would you do that? Failure is not good. We don't want people to fail. What we want to remember is that the path to success is not a straight line. So there are things that if we stop might feel like failure that actually are key learning moments on a journey to success. This isn't encouraging failure. Failure is not a good thing. And a lot of failure should in fact be punished. You do something that's stupid, you're sloppy, you haven't trained appropriately, by all means punish. But if you do the right things, you approach strategy or you approach uncertainty in a strategic way, and it turns out the wings don't quite work the way that you thought, this is great and should be celebrated. So now let's talk for just a few minutes about another challenge that we see and how you might think about overcoming it. How does strategy really work inside organizations? Now, there's a lot of good work written by people like Roger Martin that make the case that strategy drives resource allocation. And I think Martin and Lapley's book, Playing to Win, is probably the best and simplest explanation of strategy that you will find. Recommend it. Great book. That book lays out a set of cascading choices that companies make to set a strategic direction. It starts by setting a winning aspiration. You then determine where you'll play. You go and figure out how you will win. You then go and figure out the capabilities you need to build to do it, and you figure out the management systems that support it. It's exactly right. This is what good strategists do. The problem that you have inside organizations is this isn't actually what happens. What happens is the exact inverse of this. 
it's not strategy determining how you're allocating resources, it's how you're allocating resources determining your strategy. So you have ingrained management systems that hardwire a certain set of capabilities that constrain how you can win, that determine where you must play given those constraints that make the achievements that you have pretty much look like what you were doing before. This is one of the great tricks that I can pull in any organization. I can go into a company I've never met before and proclaim with a great degree of confidence that I know their strategy. Because their strategy in most cases is to do exactly what they're doing today. And CEOs will say, no, 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 that's not my strategy. My strategy is to do these other things. But strategy isn't what you say, it's what you do. Inside every organization beyond your stated strategy, you have what we call the shadow strategy. Because what your actual strategy is, is what engineers engineer. It's what the sales force chooses to sell. It's what marketing chooses to market. It's what production produces. It's what HR rewards. It's what the auditing function audits. The day-to-day -day micro level decisions in your organization determine your strategy in many cases. So what do you do when you've got these very powerful, deeply ingrained systems that in many cases constrain your ability to do anything new and different? What I'll suggest, and this is the last couple pages of content before we open up for questions again, I suggest two things. The first is how you successfully shield a specific idea from this thing called the shadow strategy. I'll have five points here. Then a couple thoughts about how you fight systematically against the shadow strategy. First, how do you guard an idea from it? First, you're very selective about the capabilities that you borrow from the core business. You only touch things that incite jealousy from your competitors or lead the startups in your market to be envious of what you have and they don't. You're very vigilant about it. You watch out for things that carry some of the shadow strategy along with it. This might be very innocent things like a spreadsheet. I remember once we were working with a consumer packaged goods company that was thinking about moving from a very fast moving basic consumer product to a higher price durable product. They asked their finance team to give them just a template they could fill in to help project how big this idea would be. The template had no line in it for the return rate of the product because for something that costs $2, if it doesn't work, you never return it. And that's what most of this company's products were. For a $250 device, if it doesn't work, you'll return it. But the team didn't even think about that because there was no line in the spreadsheet for it. It's a really simple example but reminds us that the core DNA lives in many places. We then have to be focused. If we're trying to drive the new and different, we say we've got a group that's doing the new and they're working on the new, and the core is working on the core. Core does core, new does new, and never the twain shall meet. We want to think then about the places where they actually do and be very structured about it. Our colleague Clark Gilbert, who has driven quite broad transformation in a couple of organizations now, will always create what he calls exchange teams that stands at that interface between the new and the core and very consciously in a very thoughtful and structured way manages it. And finally, you need to be active. The cases that I talked about with Clark Gilbert did not involve him devolving decision making down the organization. It involved him as the CEO of an organization standing there and making the decision. If you don't as a leader if you're not ready to go and fight against the shadow strategy, that will pull you back to doing what you did before, even if your intent is to do the new and different. So that's a few pieces of advice for what you do for a specific idea. Then what do you do to really get your organization ready to do this at scale? Here what we suggest doing is looking at the four key engines that drive allocation inside any company. The first is budgeting systems. The challenge that you face is most budgeting systems are very data driven, which will lead necessarily to prioritizing today better over tomorrow different. This means it is incredibly important to have a strategy, to have a portfolio system that allows you to handle different types of ideas. You then have asset allocation systems. This is how you allocate the people inside your organization or things like your IT systems. 
the default systems in most organizations will lead to the assets being overwhelmingly allocated to doing the core business, which means that you get understaffed innovation and growth efforts, and they're last in line to go and do different things. This is why you've got to ring, set, ring fence your resource. You need to have things like these exchange teams that we talked about. And you need to create sandboxes, safe spaces where people can go and experiment and do different things. This is a hidden and important one next. You've got time management systems where top executives are spending their time. What makes it onto the agenda? What doesn't make it onto the agenda? The default systems in most companies, again, will default to overwhelming amounts of time focused on the core. This is why you need to think about things like setting up a separate leadership structure like a council to go and oversee some of your new efforts. And why you might put in place approval circuit breakers that allow you to short circuit some of the things that are slowing you down. Finally, rewards and recognition systems that have low upside for success and, how, and high downsides for failure will stop people from taking prudent risks, which means you need to change the way you think about measuring your people. It isn't just the outcomes they achieve, it's the process that they're following. Innovation and going in a new strategic direction is a game that has luck and skill combined together. If you only look at the things people are achieving, you're going to miss people who are getting the right outcomes by following the wrong behaviors, or inversely, people who had bad results but actually did the right things. And you'll also want to think about having rewards for people based not just on what they achieve, but based on what they've learned. Now there's a lot more that we can talk about about strategy through uncertainty, but I wanted to summarize what we've talked about thus far, take a couple more questions from you, then give you one last parting thought and call it a webinar. So four main things that we've talked about thus far, make sure that you write your future back strategy to own your future. Identify a select few strategic moonshots to make that future story happen. Create data. Don't just go and get it to discover the path to success. Build wind tunnels. Fly kites. And fight tirelessly against one of the biggest enemies of driving in a new strategic direction in uncertain times, the pernicious force of the shadow strategy. So Evan, I'd love to take a few more questions from the audience. We've got about seven minutes here, so let's get a few more in. That's great. Scott, we have a couple questions uh, queued up here, one a very easy one and one a very difficult one. The easy one, is there one resource that you would recommend to learn more about designing and executing experiments in the marketplace? I think that's easy to take. Um, I, I recommend Scott's book, The First Mile, a launch manual for getting great ideas into the market. I think you would probably agree to that. And if you just Google The First Mile, you'll see it on our site and also Amazon and, and Harvard Business Review Press. So let's turn to the more difficult question. Um, by the way, that book also has a lot of resources that um, that you can jump off from. So um, highly recommended. Why don't we go to this one? Is um, Ananya asks, is a transformational leader or visionary necessary as a prerequisite to propagate a transformation? How and Related question, how does a transformational leader justify uh, his or her decisions without um, data to back it up? Snake preview. So coming out in, uh, I hope, March of next year, maybe May of next year, uh, me, Clark Gilbert, and Mark Johnson are working on a book called Dual Transformation about how you go and reinvent the core and create new growth, enabling you to become the next version of yourself. And that book does place a large onus on the leader. The, the, the hardest challenge that a leader faces is transforming their organization. And I think, we think, it simply cannot be done as a grassroots sort of effort. You need a leader who will stand up and say, we got to do something different. And they have to use a little bit of gut, intuition, and inspiration to do it because the data won't be crystal clear. So how do you do that? One of the, the big things that we talk about in the book is the courage to choose before the platform burns. By the time the platform is on fire, by the time it's clear you need to do it, you're on that downward spiral in the newspaper industry, the game is over. What a good executive does is spot the fault lines. My colleagues Dave Duncan and Andy Waldick wrote about that in a great HBR article in December of last year with Mark Bertolini from Aetna. They spot the early warning signs and they're able to tell a story, again, 
about what inaction means for the business. Mark Bertolini is a great example of this. He becomes the CEO of Aetna, everything looks great, record earnings, business is growing, have to implement things related to the Affordable Care Act, could just go and ride into the sunset, and he chooses to blow the business up because he recognizes over the long term that is the right thing to do. So I think you need to have the courage to be able to see those soft signals and make a really hard decision and then communicate it like crazy inside and outside the organization. One more question if we've got it. If not, I can provide some closing thoughts involving unicorns. Well, and Tinder, it's good. Um, Stay around for the end of it. What about, um, are there any other frameworks or methodologies you'd recommend to keep up with disruptive trends or foster that kind of disruptive thinking in your organization? So the biggest thing I would say, and we talked about this a little bit in the, the article that was the inspiration for this webinar, the biggest thing I would say about keeping up with disruptive trends is less about frameworks and more about where you're looking. And the general guidance is not to look in the core of today, but to look at the periphery. Look at things that are at the edge of your industry, outside your industry. Watch what your kids are doing. I'm trying to understand for a range of reasons the future of media. I watch what my 10-year-old boy does, which is to never watch linear television and watch seemingly for hours on end this guy called Dan TDM narrate a Minecraft game. I don't quite understand it, but this is what the media world is like today. You need to live in the periphery with the freaks and geeks and kids and edge people because they will be the ones who show you what tomorrow looks like. As William Gibson, the science fiction author, said, the future has already arrived. It's just not very evenly distributed. So with that, let me provide just a, a closing thought. So the world is gaga over these things, unicorns. The, the big thing out there is let's go and start a company up and we can become a unicorn if we're a privately held company with more than a billion dollars of value. Unicorns are incredibly sexy today. How sexy are they? I mentioned Tinder before. I will admit I'm a boring married man with three kids. I admit that makes it sound like what I'm going to say is a bad thing. It's a good, not bad thing. I've never used Tinder before, but those of you who probably have read about it. It's a dating app. You go and see a picture of someone. If you like that person, you swipe to the right. If they also swipe to the right, you've got a match, and what happens next is up to you. Tinder recently released some data about what the jobs people have, what are the jobs that people have that lead to them getting swiped right. It's pretty interesting data, hopefully appearing on your screen in just a second. If you look at what it leads to have a man swiped right, the number one job is a pilot. Tom Cruise, Top Gun, helped you for a long period of time. Number two job is being a founder or an entrepreneur. Women, the same thing. Number three job is being a founder or entrepreneur. It is incredibly sexy to be in the world of startups today. I notice here that management consultant and author is nowhere on this list, which is very disappointing, but a, a different topic entirely. Now, we at Innosight have a different belief. Well, we love startups. We have an investment arm. We invest in startups. They're great. They can have very powerful impact. But we also believe strongly and fiercely in the power of incumbency. I'll leave you with this image here. In the middle, we have one of my favorite pictures from my stock photo. This shows what it's like to try and drive strategy change inside large organizations. It's hard. The environment is hostile. The earth is cracked, but yet life can sustain. And look at the two edge pictures here and think about what they have in common. The left side of the page, the waves are crashing, the wind is blowing, the sun is shining. There is energy in that page, energy in that picture. Harnessing it, amplifying it, driving it in new directions is hard, but it's there. I believe that the greatest untapped source of energy in the world today is not on the left, it's on the right. It's inside the cubicle farms that exist inside many organizations. Incumbency has its advantage. Creative destruction has a huge transaction tax on the global economy. Market leaders can and should do so much more. You have to approach thinking in a different way. You have to act in a different way. But your organizations are capable of doing things that you can only dream of. And I hope that we've given you some mindsets, some tools, and approaches to allow you to begin that journey. So thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you for attending and your attention today. You'll get an email when the recording of today's session is available to forward to colleagues. And we welcome you to contact us at Innosight.com to download the executive briefing on turning ambiguity into opportunity. 
Also, please follow Scott on Twitter at, at Scott D. Anthony and check out his blogs on the HBR website. Uh, he's also re um, look forward to hearing you by email at the address on the screen. So on behalf of InnoSight, thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.